For these next Sundays in Lent, we are going to be reading some stories about our neighbors in the Gospel of John. They're actually the stories offered us in the lectionary that we are following. They're beautiful stories, and they are long stories. So we are going to invite you to remain seated as we read the Gospel these next few weeks. This morning's story comes from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who ascended from, descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. have a vision of the worship committee going, in what ways can we really freak out the pastors as they've gone? <laughs> One of them's right here laughing really hard. Excuse me. Earlier this week, I was part of a conversation where the leader urged us to cultivate congregational communities of surprise, to tell stories, to listen to alternate voices, and to open ourselves up to the transformative power of conversation with those we might think of as other. And in my notes, I put a big box around the words, communities of surprise. Many years ago, Ted and I belonged to a church, and I tell you, I always ask permission before I tell stories about my husband. Ted and I belonged to a church that did a Sunday morning Lenten series where people told their faith story. And Ted asked our pastor if he could tell an unfaith story. Pastor John was understandably hesitant, but Ted persisted, saying that he was unlikely the only one who showed up on Sunday mornings filled with questions and not everyone could relate to these personal testimonies of faith. Ted was assigned the Sunday after Easter otherwise known as Doubting Thomas Sunday. (laughs) Ted told of growing up in the church, of the events that had begun to challenge his thinking and how the questions soon overwhelmed whatever certainties he may have once had. And he ended his talk with these words. All I really know is this. If I walk away, I lose. He spoke first at a Saturday night service, and by Sunday morning, word had traveled fast, and the pews were filled, people bringing their friends and their family to hear Ted, some coming back Sunday after having been there on Saturday. And after worship, members, leaders, strangers, and even the council president came to shake his hand and to say in whispers, 
I thought I was the only one. Nicodemus came under the cover of darkness to investigate this Jesus, whispering his own questions. We don't know if Nicodemus comes on his own or if he represents a small, equally curious cadre when he says, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. Nicodemus knows something, but not enough, he thinks, to face the daylight. Nicodemus asks questions about what a person can do. The word can is used six times in the first verses of this reading, and Nicodemus represents this religious authority that finds righteousness in the things that can be done in activities and rituals, and he struggles to understand what can be done to see the kingdom of God. And Jesus patiently engages Nicodemus in holy dialogue, giving Nicodemus time and space to ask his questions and to puzzle over Jesus' answers. And Jesus isn't easy to understand. He speaks in imagery and metaphor, talking wind and spirit and water and being born from above. It's helpful, I think, for us to just take a minute to say it is hard to fully understand a single story from John because the entire gospel is so beautifully constructed with these strong themes running throughout it and one story weaves into the next and builds on the one before it. So we need the whole gospel to understand a single story. And we don't have time to read 21 chapters of John this morning. But for an example, when Jesus speaks of being born of water and spirit, Jesus isn't talking about baptism precisely as we understand it. Because after his resurrection, Jesus will breathe the spirit of life into his disciples gathered in the locked room. When Jesus said, God so loved the world, Jesus will leave Nicodemus and head into the world right into enemy territory where he will promise a Samaritan woman a wellspring of living water. When Jesus speaks of light and darkness, he recalls the prologue to the gospel where the light shines in the darkness, the true light which enlightens everyone and his own reject him. Over the course of this patient conversation, Jesus shows Nicodemus that salvation is not a list of cans to be accomplished. Instead, the surprise of salvation is that light, life-giving water, and empowering spirit all come directly from God, from above, a gift because God so loves the world. Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus has transformative power. Nicodemus will now stick close by, even in daylight, taking it all in. And at the end, Nicodemus will stand ready to honor Jesus' broken body when it's taken from the cross. The Gospel of John is full of examples of the transformative power of holy conversation. We will encounter one next week, with a woman at the well, and the week after that in the story of the man born blind. Two awesome stories, and I encourage you to be here for them. The conversations all begin with puzzlement and questions about the rule of religious law and the way things have always been. And Jesus offers a new and fresh perspective on light and water and wind and spirit, and eyes and hearts are open to new ways to see God. Just as it's hard to understand a single story apart from the gospel, we do a terrible disservice if we distill this story down to a single verse that is then used to condemn. John's words are not intended to condemn the unbeliever. John is writing to a particular group of people in a particular time And he is writing of the choices his own community will make regarding light and darkness, belief and unbelief. And John is assuring those who follow Jesus that their choice is life-giving despite the hardship it will cause them. 
What matters to the modern hearer of this story is that God so loved the world that God gave us everything and that the world God loves includes enemies and courageous questioners and curious outsiders, even those once thought beyond the scope of God's kingdom like a Samaritan woman or a man born blind. If you think about it, Nicodemus is actually a really sympathetic character. He's a man in religious authority, in the unfamiliar position of finding himself shy about professing his burgeoning curiosity about Jesus, preferring to stay in the shadows. So what a privilege it is that we get to listen in on their holy transformative dialogue. Because Nicodemus reminds us that there, the divisions between belief and unbelief aren't so tidy. Coming out of the darkness doesn't mean waiting until we have a fully realized faith and a happy ending story. We can live in the light when we boldly declare that we don't understand much about the God story, but for some reason we know we can't walk away. We can scratch our heads and say that worship matters somehow, even if we cannot explain it to anybody else. And when we say in frustration that this Bible is so confounding, I just can't put it down. Telling our faith stories means just that. Telling our stories. No one else's. You have a voice you have experience, you have curiosity, you have doubt that is uniquely yours, and you are not alone. Jesus invites us and our questions into the light and assures us that life comes from God, and we may not understand it, but like the wind, we can somehow see its effects, and we can do the same for others. Be patient listeners and encouragers of story. Ted did not marry a Lutheran pastor. So when I began to discern the call of the Spirit, it came as a surprise in some ways to both of us. And the surprising spirit began, as the surprising spirit began to blow in my life, he began to blow in Ted, the spirit began to blow in his life too. Ted took over the household books and uncomplainingly wrote tuition check after tuition check. He handled baths and bedtime so I could sort out my Hebrew homework. He didn't laugh the first time I put on a clerical collar. And that's real. That is terrifying. And Ted didn't laugh. And on the first Sunday of my internship, and for hundreds of Sundays thereafter, he got three kids to church dressed, fed, and reasonably clean. And we became a household of surprise. His faith grew, and my faith grew. Not in the same ways, not at the same pace, and certainly not always following a particular orthodoxy that fits neatly into defined boxes. We still have questions that we whisper to our trusted ones. We still look on in puzzlement and wonder as much as we look on in gratitude and confidence and we are continually surprised to find where the call of the Spirit has taken us both. The truth is, in darkness or in light, our God stories matter. Curious conversations and honest questions are holy. They are holy interactions, and they work in the hearts of human beings as the life-giving, surprising breath of the Holy Spirit. You know, we look on in horror as young people through the power of storytelling and conversation are radicalized into committing acts of terror and violence. How can we then fail to grasp or fall timidly silent before the transformative power that rests in our hands? Holy conversation, storytelling, and deep story listening. We are the people of a God of surprise. God began the surprise by breathing life into human form and then inviting us into partnership with God. 
God surprised Abraham and Sarah with a call to go and with a son. God surprised Jacob on the riverside with a wrestling match. God surprised an enslaved people with liberation and a new land. God surprised the young widow Ruth with a second chance at love and made her the grandmother of the shepherd boy David, who God surprised with a crown. God surprised a people in waiting with a tiny baby born in poverty, and God surprised the guests at a wedding banquet with astounding wine, and God surprised Nicodemus by welcoming his questions. And God will surprise us all with life when death should win the day. Our stories are not yet written, folks. We are works in progress, and we are part of each other's process. So whether you shout or whether you whisper, tell your stories boldly, say your prayers hopefully, ask your questions courageously, and listen to another deeply. And find yourself swept up in the surprising work of the Holy Spirit in transformative conversation. Thanks be to God. Amen.